plot is really about a family and how they became notorious serial killers. It's one of the most horrific American stories ever. It needed to feel like the beginning of hell. Nothing can prepare you for what's going on at this house. This is the story of Thomas Hewitt. There's never going to be a worse story. What we wanted to show was how did he get the mask? Why did he decide to put the mask on? How did he first start using a chainsaw? It is so gory. You violate all your sense of taste. Wonderful. We have pushed it to the limit. There's no question about it. Beautiful bastard, you. That's what we were aiming for, is just push things as far as they can go. I saw the original 1973 Texas Chainsaw Massacre at a midnight showing when I was about uh, 15 or 16. I remember sitting there totally stressed out, wishing it would end, but then not wanting it to ever end because I was having like the greatest film-going experience of my life. I was very apprehensive when I was asked to do the remake. I knew it would be compared to Toby Hooper's rendition. It turned out so well. The audience loved the 2003 remake. It was hardcore. It didn't pull any punches. It was a real in-your-face, nasty horror movie. The audiences were starved for that. It became a big hit. We made the movie for $9 million, and the movie made 120 worldwide. The fans kept wanting another chainsaw. We talked about the idea of making another one, and we decided no. We were very happy with what we did, and the movie didn't need a sequel. Over the years subsequent to that movie, a lot of people come up to us talking about the family and what an amazing family and how did that family get that way. We sat down with Michael and discussed whether or not that's a compelling story. The first pick for the writer was Scott Kozar, who wrote the original. Scott, unfortunately, was not available. Sheldon, who he had worked with on Amityville Horror, was naturally the next guy we would go to. We start talking about what this movie is going to be. There were questions that we wanted to have answered in this film. There were characters who ended up a way that they were, and we wanted to describe how they became that way. In the 2003 movie, Old Monty has no legs, so we wanted to show how he loses his legs. Sheriff Hoyt doesn't have his front teeth. Look at that shit. And we're showing how he lost his front teeth. Now we go further into the franchise, establishing the definitive backstory. All the questions, the whys, the whys, the how in the world. The main idea was to show how Leatherface was spawned. That's the ugliest thing I ever saw. How did the love affair with the chainsaw begin? How did he become Leatherface? What's wrong with his face in the first place? All this plays against the background of some kids driving across Texas to enlist in the Vietnam War. Through a terrible turn of events, they end up right there in this horrible town. When the script came in as strong as it did, we were prepared to make it. Our producers are seasoned veterans. I mean, they didn't just fall off the turnip truck. Michael Bay, Brad Fuller, and Andrew Forum, together as a producing team, have not only established themselves as great new filmmakers on their own, they started a new company with bold designs on the industry. It's a Platinum Dunes film. This is a brand that Michael has set up to deliver a certain genre. I think he's got a real sense now of his audience and what they're looking for. The whole idea is to do lower budget movies to help younger directors break into film. Action! Jonathan Liebsman has been in our life for quite some time now. When we were doing the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was on our short list of 10 directors. Revolution and Sony scooped him up to do a movie called Darkness Falls, which took him right off of our list. He had a miserable experience, and he wanted to give up the business. I said, don't give up the business. Work with us, and I will help you, and it'll be a nice experience. When I first met Michael, it was one of the most inspiring meetings I ever came out of. We just spoke about films and filmmaking. To meet someone like Michael Bay and communicate at the level of a filmmaker makes you realize, I can do this too. Jonathan was able to show us what he could do with that screenplay and how he could elevate it. That was all we needed to hear. Jonathan was our number one choice. Yes. Before I came to shoot, I watched all the dailies of Marcus Nispel's movie. I think what works about that film is the complete dedication the director and the actors had for that movie. That was a huge priority of mine to make sure to recreate that so we had the same feeling with this film. We look for kids that are kind of breaking out and that have done stuff. I always look for people that are, can be break out to be stars. The four actors who we cast as the kids, those are the people that the audience is going to relate to and the emotions that these kids are feeling is what the audience is going to be feeling. You're always looking for people who are sympathetic ultimately. 
I think one of the most frightening things for me as a director on this movie was wondering who the lead of the movie was going to be. If I don't have someone that good, I'm gonna have to go way beyond my abilities to bring someone up there. Luckily for me, it was Jordana Brewster. Jordana is a dream to work with. She's incredibly intelligent. She's a smart actress. She makes great choices and she really brings a lot to the table. Brewster is so talented. She pulls off someone who's vulnerable and afraid Every time she goes in to save someone or help someone, you can tell that she doubts she'll ever make it through that situation. Let's roll, please, rolling. It's a great challenge, because we have to be at this sort of elevated state of anxiety for, you know, for the whole shoot, basically. No! 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 We tried to strike a balance between, you know, complete heroine versus a girl who's just, you know, a damsel in distress. I had a scene with Arlie Army where he was, his character was sort of justifying what they do. You blasphemous bitch! <laughs> That's what this is. Really pissed me off, so I think I used that for the character too, in terms of just not wanting to surrender and not wanting to be one of their victims. <laughs> oh my God. The next person who we cast was Diora Baird. We wanted to have someone who's just kind of like a free spirit. Diora comes in the room and you meet her and she simply is Balian. I would describe her as feisty, fiery, very sassy. Have you seen Leatherface? She's fucking scary. Very much a hippie of her time and kind of a hopeless romantic, but she's got an edge to her. If I were to be put in a situation like this, there'd become a point where it's just like, are you kidding me? What is wrong with you people? She's really kind of amazing when she's scared. Watching the monitors during her takes is very unsettling. Diora was a bit of a firecracker. Ah! The screaming has definitely um, taken a physical toll on me. Ah! Ah! I was out here and I could hear it. Oh, it was blood curdling. Ah! I just feel bad because I think the audience is just going to get so sick of hearing me scream. They're like, shut her up. Ah! That sucked. The next actor we cast was Taylor Hanley. Oh. He's the only actor who I've ever cast straight off an audition. I don't know, it's crazy. And I'm supposed to die because some piece of paper says so. Taylor had one of the most amazing auditions I'd ever seen. I'm not fucking going, man. Rice patties and hand grenades? I'm not built for that, Eric. I'm not fucking built for that, man. We just looked at each other and we were like, we have to get this guy right now. He's just an immensely talented actor. But when he gets up there, you just believe that he's going through it, and he goes through horrible, horrible things in this film. This is an infection through a series of misfortunate events. I've winded up here at uh, the Hewitt house. I thought we just, we just got all the blood off. Yeah. Yeah. About to be tortured, maybe killed. The last role, the role that Matt Bomer's playing, the role of Eric, was a really difficult role to cast. It was hard to find a guy who's tough, but who's kind of sympathetic. I've cast Taylor first, so I have to cast a guy that Taylor can kind of look like he's brothers with. At the end of the day, I, I asked Jordana to come in and just audition with 10 actors a day, and we did that for three or four days, and Bomer came in, and we loved him, and that was it. The guy is definitely a star. Come on! Shoot me, you asshole! There's an intensity to him that makes you want to keep watching. Mom, are you proud? What a gorgeous guy he is. He has the most fantastic eyes. Oh, he's so beautiful. Ah! I've always wanted to do a horror movie my whole life. You don't have to do this. It's good to get to flex some of the muscles that you might not get to flex in a different type of genre. The kind of the physically demanding stuff. I've, I think that's really been um, my favorite part of this. Been through a car wreck, I've been hung up and tortured on the run for quite some time. I had about a week and a half where I was relatively clean cut. It's too early, I don't even know what just happened. <laughs> it's a lot of fun though. Brad Fuller and Andrew Form were really great about bringing us down here earlier and just kind of establishing an ensemble. We got to Austin about a week early and we shot some scenes like with a camcorder and we worked on the script. It's very important, especially when you're doing something where they have to have a connection and bonding and friendship. <laughs> you're such a fucker. We get them there early, we get them to hang out together so that they start to become friends. I already told you, I'm not going in that pool, Eric. I think it was the last wish of the soldier. Please, you can get that, which is all left the most important thing is to just make the characters really organic so that then once they get into this roller coaster ride, you, you buy into it. 
<laughs> Another important thing for me was that we had the same family members. You kids okay? We knew that Arlie Army was coming back as Sheriff Hoyt, and we knew that Marietta Marich was coming back as Luda May and Terrence Evans as Old Monty, and the tea lady would be also returning. We will never abandon the place of our birth. When we cast the 2003 movie, getting Lee Army was like a mark of quality. Hey! You kids best not be making a mess in my car. You'll clean it up. He was such an icon for me from Full Metal Jacket. I will rip off your head and shit down your neck. He's the guy you love to hate. You just keep sweet talking me, Dumpling. Brad called up and asked, would you consider doing another one? I'd love to do the sheriff again. Whoa! Look at that! Now, that was one fine push-up there. Whenever you're doing these intense movies, it's always good to have a, a comic release. <laughs> you fucking asshole! You son of a bitch! Come into my fucking house! He would give this bizarre reality to his character, but he was funny at the same time. You people thought this was easy. That's why we make the big bucks. It was fun sort of molding a bit of a character with him and exploring things which he explored in his head on the first movie but never got a chance to actually act out. He's dead pretty. Let's face it, Hoyt is a uh, sexually perverted homicidal maniac. The most entertaining, colorful, shocking, dastardly character that I've ever played. Ladies love men in uniform. This is fun for me. Marietta is a seasoned veteran, a very accomplished actress. She was competing with Marilyn Monroe back in the 50s, for Christ's sake. I did, believe it or not, glamour roles. Singing and dancing and television and radio. I'd done just about everything. You see what you done? You killed that sheriff and you started up a whole whirlwind. You know, an actor who's been working that long has a lot of ideas. She came up with her singing to Diora, which to me is one of the creepiest things in the movie. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Uncle Monty. Pretty little Roscoe, ain't you? Terrence is a great guy, and he's a fantastic actor. He is Uncle Monty. Monty, poor thing, he just gets hurt. <laughs> All the time. I didn't bring any problems, why'd he shoot me? Here I am, practically an innocent. Someone who we also thought was very important to us is bringing back Andrew Bernarski, who played Thomas Hewitt, Leatherface, because we were very happy with everything he did in the first movie. I was born to wear the mask. There's nobody that's going to be as scary as me or bring what I could bring to this character. Here I am for the second time playing this iconic role. Andrew is crazy. He's a big physical beast. The first time I saw him as Leatherface was in the middle of a scene. It scared the shit out of me. I mean, he was into it. He was committed, really giving 150%. He's an extremely physical guy. He has to run around with that chainsaw and 40 pounds of clothes and a mask you can't see through. And he's willing to do that and embraces it. He is so into being Leatherface, it's awesome. For a role like that, you have to commit, and he does. Maybe a little too much. He is so strong. I don't even think he realizes how much strong, because usually the actors give and take. I never got a chance to give. <laughs> I have to say. What's so fantastic about him is he honestly believes in this character. He loves this character so much. When he puts on that mask, he becomes this guy. And as everybody will see, he really is Leatherface. Andrew's gone. I get to play such a great character. It doesn't bother me ever that he doesn't speak or that I have not the usual tools that most people rely on. When you take away one's primary tool of communication, all that's left is your body language, your eyes, the emotion in your face. At certain key points in the filming and in the discussion about the character, all they've had to say to me is, remember, this is not the leather face that we already know. This is the story of how a man and becomes such a monster. In the 2003 movie, there was much more focus on the five kids that were traveling across Texas and less focus on the family. When we decided to make the prequel, we were gonna shift the focus to the family, really show where they're coming from. In general, they were just really kind of just this innocent farm family, kind of struggling to survive. This family has endured through adversity and pain. 
These people live in such solitude. I think the lack of human contact has produced this surreal reality for them. Nothing comes between this old farmer and his family. Get him, Tommy, come on! This is like a feral pack of dogs, but there's enough that bonds them, and there's enough natural primal necessity to solidify that as a family unit. I was hungry, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. These people don't think it's abnormal at all what they're doing. Just do whatever you're going to do, you bunch of degenerates. I will not have you speak ill of this family. To them, it is absolutely normal when you go through those doors. It's their rules, and nothing else applies. Hell, we're in the middle of Texas. Where else would you go to shoot this movie? It would be weird if you were shooting the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in Vancouver. Let's face it, in Texas, you have every climate, every terrain. It has the hills, it has the black country, and this house. A lot of our movie plays in the middle of nowhere where there, there's no people around. Help me! We kind of had to find places where you could look 360 degrees and there was nothing. I think that's one of the things that makes this franchise so scary. You're in this void, basically. There's nothing here. There's nobody here to help you. And that's the whole point, is like, if there were people driving by all the time, they'd be like, hey, there's somebody killing someone with a chainsaw. There are no sets in this movie, so everything is an actual location. Action! When you can film on location and not build your sets, it's real. You know, you're not walking off the set, and you're looking, and you're in some warehouse. Y'all have some beautiful things in here, ma'am. Marco Rubeo, the production designer, did an amazing job. One of the strong elements of the last movie was the production design. We had to bring that into new locations like the slaughterhouse, bring back the Hewitt house in the basement three years earlier than they were in Marcus Nispel's movie. Action! I think we were actually trying to make a different film, and in a lot of ways we kind of ended up doing a lot of similar things that they did. Especially with the same sets, we sort of made sure we matched a lot of things so that the viewer could tie some certain elements together. The house is just stunning. It's a creepy, creepy place in the middle of nowhere. Where are you taking us? Where are you taking us, sir? The house is the star of the movie in a lot of ways. We were lucky to get the house again. It's the same place that we shot the last one, so we're really kind of recreating it. We were shooting at the Hewitt house for, I think, what ended up being almost four weeks. Almost half of the shoot was in this one location. Conceptually, the house is more of just a typical farm family trying to be self-sufficient. In the last film, they used the downstairs, but in this film, they decided to use the upstairs as well. It's the most spectacular set decoration. The set dressing, everything, is so good. A lot of taxidermy rabbits and squirrels, and Jonathan wanted feathers on the floor. It's just a little twisted. That steel door is supposed to lead down into the basement. You'll see it in the slaughterhouse, and then you'll see it as the basement door. There is another room which is new to this film from the last one, it's the dining room. That slaughterhouse was more important to this town than them fools will ever know. The interesting thing about it was the imagery around the table, this big cow head on the wall and a pig over here just gives a little touch of oddity. When we decided to use the Hewitt house, the basement at that house did not work for us. We were lucky enough to find a closed down cotton gin that had an amazing basement we basically had to just put it back to very similar to what it was for the previous film. That meant a little bit of building and plaster and paintwork. One of the things that you'll notice most in the basement is the bone grinder. It's circular, it's always backlit. We had to have a couple things like that that tied it together. There was also new things too, like the table that Eric gets sawn through. The slaughterhouse, which you'll see in the movie right now, was all Marco. We walked in, there was nothing. It had a ceiling, there was not even any walls. He was able to do some sketches build us a model and show us exactly what it would look like. We see the slaughterhouse in two different time periods, 1939 and 1970. For the exterior in the 1939 version, we've enhanced all the lettering, and everything's wet down a little more, and the dumpsters are there for the action where Ludemay finds baby Leatherface. In the condemned 1969 version, it's a lot more run down. The Lee Brothers sign is a lot more faded. It just looks kind of shut down. As far as interior-wise, the biggest difference was really the dressing. In the active 1939 slaughterhouse, there was meat on the hooks, and it was a working place with a few extras in the background chopping meat. The big sides of beef that we had hanging, 
So what we ended up doing is renting foam rubber type meat, and we dressed it up a bit. That was all fake. In the 1969 version, the meat's gone. Hooks are sort of upside down and kind of everything's stored. That's one of my favorite locations. It's brilliant. The way that there's this kind of shaft of light from the roof where you put this window and the way the supervisor's office is just above gives the director great angles. I love that Leatherface is born in that location. And cut. It was important to me to have people from the last movie so that I could ask questions. Peter Simonite, the camera operator, would put the lenses on for Marcus. It was just interesting to me, you know, what lens did Marcus use for this shot or this look or that? Randy, the set decorator, worked on the last movie and it was just very helpful to pick her brain and see what was used for different scenes. That doesn't mean that our entire crew is veterans. We aren't scared away from hiring people who have great experience, but who've never made the jump to the next level up. We did that with our costume designer. We did that with our DP. Because at the end of the day, we feel that someone who has something to prove will go the extra mile and make it that much better. There are a lot of departments that have to gel. There's a lot of people trying to make the same movie, and I think the biggest part of directing is just making sure everyone's always on the same page. Because once you're in a production environment, it's not only in your head and the writer and the producer's head. Now it has to be in 200 people's head. Well, what about if he says, yeah, I'm just trying to find a place for him to say that, because... Well, I'd love it if he said it right here. And then Jonathan has the confidence of an elephant. So, Eric, can you get into place when you're there? He calls the shots. He knows what lens he wants on there. He's good. Um, I was just trying to, to be um, warm. warm until we shot. He's very open to suggestion. He's one of those guys that's such a nice guy that you want to work really hard for him. You really want to give him the best performance you can. I want to take time. I want to take a beat of her on the ground oh, and you like build up. With Jonathan, I realized that the reason right away he was the right guy for the job is because he cared so much. That must have been what Bay and the guys saw in him. Somebody that would treat it with nothing but respect and never take it lightly for a minute. It works. I love it. Yeah. Victory. The face. This far away. Levo. Rocket. Brian and Andrew are so hands-on, which is which is new for me, because usually the producers, you never see them. Action! They're there, and if they have a comment, they come right up to me, and they come up to Jonathan. Right, they're there for every single take. They will sit behind the monitor on every single take. They're just meticulous about what they do. Michael Bay also oversees the project. That, I think, is also incredibly helpful. Michael watches the dailies. He develops the scripts. He's aware of everything that's happening on set. I mean, definitely, I think some of it should be, you know, on her hands, you know what I mean? If there's any problem, Bay's always available. I love that. I love that they were so passionate about it, and this is as important to them as it is to me. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to get the best moment. We're all trying to find the, the right moment. The last movie, I think it's one of the best shots in the movies. The cinematography was amazing. We wanted to be inspired by their style, but not duplicated. That's mainly our discussion, is where to differ and where to be the same. You know, there's certain shots which are iconic from the first movie, which we wanted to sort of almost pay homage to, and there were parts where we wanted to deviate for different reasons. We try to take the glossiness of the last movie and add to it the prequel element. This is a little earlier, this movie is a little raw, a little grittier. But we were going for a little bit more of a documentary kind of feel, a little bit looser, almost a touch less stylized. It's just intense, handheld, hectic. Everything feels sort of staccato. We had two sync sound cameras, and our third camera was a Nary 235, the lightest camera out there. We call that Lucas Cam because it's instead of steady cam, it was kind of just me doing whatever with the camera. Whenever the steady cam was too smooth and we really wanted a lot more energy, John would always be like, "It's time for Lucas Cam." We had smoke in so many of the sets and atmosphere. It's such a big part of the look of these movies is that you can feel the air and it's kind of dingy and never wants to be too clean. Jonathan has a really interesting way of putting the camera. He's always putting stuff in front of the camera so that the camera's sort of viewing through things, looking through blades of grass or looking over the steering wheel or looking through the crate. Jonathan was very, very supportive of a gutsy look. He was always like, darker, darker. He knew exactly what he wanted to see and what he didn't want to see, which helped me to be gutsy in my decisions. When I work with Lucas, there's a shorthand in the understanding of what I'm going for in a shot. Handheld on Matt, and I need handheld on Dean, and then maybe come back and just follow Hoyt. If I ask to push into something or gain a low angle or certain lens, he tends to put the camera exactly where I would have put the camera. <laughs> Knowing Jonathan, every shot in this movie was a low angle. It makes things more ominous, and it makes things a little more threatening. You know, if you have Letterface sort of towering over the camera, it makes him look larger than life. I'm afraid you. 
What was so important to myself and the producers when we met each actor was to tell them how physical this movie was going to be and how insane it was going to be. <laughs> there are places in the movie where the pace really picks up. There's this kinetic energy that you're not used to in these types of movies. And I've heard Brad try and persuade them not to doing the movie. I mean, that's how physical we think the movie is. <laughs> are you sure you want to do this? It's going to be hot or it's going to be cold and the days are long and the nights are long. You're going to run like crazy. You're going to fall down. <laughs> We need you to do it a thousand times. I'd say the most pain I had to endure was being pulled out of the car with the crowbar. <laughs> that was a little um, painful. <laughs> I'm just being tortured. <laughs> there was a scene where there's a hoe under my back getting the feeling back in my arms was the most excruciating thing I'd ever felt. I was like <laughs> pins and needles the whole time. I got made fun of initially because I run on a treadmill at the gym. Hi. Andrew Form told me that I looked like I was running in the chariots of fire. So then they told me to run messy and with your arms up in the air. I was way faster than all the camera operators. So I was like, well, how's that? You have a 35-pound chainsaw. It's smoking right into your face the whole time you're doing it. I'm running after 20-something kids who are fast and fresh. Insane. But so what? No, I don't think there's anything physical that I can't do in a film. I'm that over 60 body that has an 18-year-old mind. Boom. When the scene calls for me to bash my head against the concrete pavement, that's exactly what I do. Action. Boom! Halfway to the count, dickhead. Is that all you got, motherfucker? My money says you're not going anywhere. You know what? That's why they make Anison. One of my favorite scenes is the insane Olympics. Hoyt <laughs> takes Dean and makes him do 20 push-ups and just beats the shit out of him. We shot the push-up scene over a period of six or seven scattered days. In the first three days, I was feeling okay, getting beat with the baton and getting stomped on. After 12 hours of getting hit, you know, so many setups, I was like, stop, okay, come on. Can we just double her? And poor Matthew, too. I mean, they were shooting second unit for, like, hours with Matt just chained to that table. And that, to me, would be torture. But he was cool with it. Scream for me, Matt. Chainsaw. <laughs> Chainsaw. And blood as soon as you can. I've really enjoyed doing some of my own stunt work. You know, getting dropped from the car was really fun because it was kind of like my own private roller coaster ride. They just strapped me in. I was the only one in the car. Hey, and they dropped it. I knew if they were letting me do it that it had to be safe. We actually wrapped Matthew's head in the saran wrap. <laughs> Shit. Now look what you did. You broke my goddamn salary. Sorry. I was concerned about that, and Matthew was a little weary of it, too. I am somewhat claustrophobic, and to have your hands tied and have saran wrap wrapped around your face, it's pretty gruesome. Even if you leave a little gap down here for him to possibly breathe, the first time he goes, <gasps> you know, that little gap just clings shut, and so now the kid's out of air. If he was having a problem, if there was any problem at all, he would indicate by making a certain move. <laughs> please, sir, can you, can you let him breathe, please? Matt, you all right? I would just knock my knees together. <laughs> that was kind of my cry for help. Anytime I was thinking about complaining or anything like that, I just figured, well, it's going to be a really good scene in the movie, so it'll be worth it. The Chainsaw Massacre movie that we did in 2003 really set the stage for the horror boom that's happened over the last few years, you know, with movies like Saw and Hostel. Yeah. Yeah. Just took it back to, let's make it intense, let's make it scary, and, uh, you know, let's give them a good ride. Oh. 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 Crack it up! The 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre is something that people associate with pushing the horror envelope in terms of insanity. People want to see things that are a little bit extreme. There are a lot of movies which have come out lately which really push things and if you want to stay out front you have to go further. The marketplace changes constantly. You know, this year we had Hostel and Hills Have Eyes. And Hostel, they, they pulled no, there's no punches pulled in that movie at all. The guys that went to see Hostel and Hills Have Eyes are gonna go see Chainsaw oh, wow. and expect it to be kicked up a notch. Our special effects people, these guys have done a killer job. We have a really, really good relationship with Michael Bay and the producers of Platinum Dunes. We did a couple gags on the first Chainsaw movie. We did Amityville Horror. We were just rapping on The Hitcher. We've sort of become their, their uh, in-house makeup effects guys. Those guys know this world very well. They've done over 500 horror movies or movies that had effects or blood in them, so they know what we want. It's a hard thing to do because it has to look real. The real challenge with this movie was the design of Leatherface. Can't do it by myself. I can make the face scary, but not until they make the face. We did a whole bunch of different designs in a couple different directions. To me, the scarier version of Leatherface is his face with the pock marks and the acne marks. And, I mean, that to me, it, they look like warts. One of the big storylines for the movie was the evolution of the mask. In the beginning of the first half of the movie, the character would only be wearing what he had made that he had been wearing for many years as a child. Michael has some very, very specific ideas about what he wants the mask to look like. And he talked about this sort of half-face mask with a lot of buckles that was made out of leather. He said he wanted it to almost look like an old football helmet and maybe he had cut some leather off of like a football because you want to get the idea that later on when he uses human skin that he's sort of cannibalizing the pieces that he needs to put the thing together. Jonathan had kind of a different image in mind. He wanted more of a full-face piece of leather that had been stretched and distressed to carry on the leather face concept of using a skin. It would just be an animal skin versus a human skin. Ultimately, Jonathan agreed that it would be good not to cover up too much of his face. It gave Leatherface a little bit more humanity in the beginning of the movie, before he becomes a monster. Aside from just the initial design of the masks, then we had to design Leatherface's makeup, because the idea was halfway through, when he kills Eric and skins Eric's face, then we had to really make it so that he could wear that face. I like your new face. Leatherface is three years less skilled at making face masks. This is the first time that he's peeling off the skin of someone's face, so it's really just one face. There was a slight evolution of the mask once it got the set. They had decided that they wanted to also incorporate a lot of his hair. Kevin and Jake on set created two flaps, so it looked like that it was cut up the back and then around. That face would sort of stretch and conform to Andrew Bernarski's face. It was challenging. All in all, I was really happy with the end result. Ah! Each scene has its own crazy challenges. The Holden scene was tough to shoot. The only thing worse than falling on a chainsaw is having it start up while it's in you. And it rumbles, 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 rumbles. I'm split completely in two. Cut, 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 cut. How to kill Holden. The saw goes through his torso. Three, Here we two, go. one, drop. We had the dummy on the ground, and we actually built a little platform a couple inches high, and we left a groove for the saw to be able to go into. We had to secure Holden's body down. We literally drywall screwed through the body just to make sure that when the chainsaw touched it, it just didn't stop. It was fun that I am the first person to ever be killed by a chainsaw by Leatherface. Action! Three, oh! two, one! and then I'm out of the movie. That's it. After Holden's killed, Leatherface impales Eric with the chainsaw while Chrissy's right under there with her boyfriend's bloods burning all over her. This is incredible to me. I mean, it's really one of the gnarliest scenes I've ever seen in, in, in a horror film. It's, it's just intense. The gag that I know that we're the most proud of is the actual death of Eric on the table. What we ended up doing would be to build a full dummy of the guy that had a cable-operated head and neck so that the head and the neck could be moving around. And then the whole chest area was filled with fake entrails and blood. And they could actually take the saw and go Rrr.
One of the signature moments is sort of Leatherface's discovery of the idea that now that he's killed, he can put on this new face. So we did a cast of the actor, we sculpted his face, and then in the mold making process, we actually created the skinned version of him. It had glass eyes in it, it had the muscle, the nose was missing, the teeth were exposed. We created a silicone skin, punched all the hair, punched the eyebrows, painted it all up, attached it to this muscle core with the eyes and the teeth, and then put a bunch of blood and slime and stuff underneath it. It's a really sort of frightening image. Pretty spectacular. One of my favorite gags was this whole cow getting hit by the truck. Anytime anything fast comes in contact with a body filled with liquid, it all of a sudden atomizes and vaporizes right. into liquid. It's like suspending a bag of, of guts That's in midair and hitting it. I came up with this idea of making a fiberglass cow so you could just fill it up like a bathtub. The top shell part was removable and we filled it with fake entrails and fake bones and then we screwed it all together. So when the car hits it, it just becomes a shower of gore. Jonathan looked at it and went, are you crazy? He's got one scene that I think is a true classic horror movie scene. Monty gets shot in the knee and uh, they gotta do a little surgery. Oh, no! Oh, I can't tell you how realistic it was. Very hard to watch. What we did was we made fake legs that were chainsawable, rebuilt the anatomy of the leg, and then put a big giant tube in the middle of it that was filled with blood. So when the saw went through, it would go through the flesh, the muscle, and then into the blood tube. And the blood tube was sealed on both ends, so it could just explode. Got my legs folded under me in the chair so that you can't see my legs at all. The fake legs are out front. My own legs were stuck in a box underneath me. Of course, you don't know what's gonna happen until it's happened already. When he cut that leg off, it was shocking. Holy Christ. You're looking at the stump of one, whap, there goes the other one. You know, I had suspended my disbelief. That was my leg. It was just fun to watch. You know, it's the type of thing that the next day after we shot it, I just wanted to watch it again and again. One of the other gags that we did in the dinner scene is when Bailey uh, gets her throat cut. There goes that PG rating. What we really wanted to do, something you don't really get a chance to see often, is we wanted to make the prosthetic thick. A lot of times when you do slit throats, the prosthetic is very thin with a little blood bladder underneath it, and the blood pours out. The appliance was sculpted specifically thicker, knowing that the camera was going to be at a certain angle, so you would actually see some depth to it. Excuse me. I don't know what happened. We shot a couple different variations where it's like really fast or really slow, lots of blood, and then not quite so much blood. We literally did it nine times, I think. It's really a violent action. And then you got this really cool moment where Dean gets in front of Leatherface and Leatherface just impels him from behind. Cutting. Set him down, set him down. Before I get stabbed with the chainsaw, they put a half a chainsaw and they'll tape that onto me and then they'll put a revolving piece in my back and so it'll look like I've been stabbed through. There's your Christmas card, Taylor. That was a tough scene to shoot. He had to be on a harness, lift it up. <laughs> tough for Andrew Bonoski too, because he had to keep him still, so the harness wouldn't go all over the place. And then after that, though, they'll put the molded torso in the clothes that I have, and they'll show the stabbing. You get the effect of seeing the chainsaw go through, going through my body. Poor little Taylor Handley, dead. Then it's just Chrissy and Leatherface. Chrissy gets to the car and fuck knows what the ending's gonna be. When you really sit back and start thinking about this movie, you go, 
Well, wait a second. It's the prequel, and Leatherface is still around to create havoc in subsequent movies, so everybody has to die. We had several discussions about how to kill Chrissy. We talked a little bit about having Leatherface come across the seat and stab her. What if he guts her? What if he stabs her here and brings the knife upward and all her insides sort of spill out? We ended up building several torsos and sort of left it up to whatever they felt was dramatically the best. This is Leatherface. He uses a chainsaw. That's his calling card. <laughs> To me, it never hurt to have a little bit of blood. Blood! Blood! The blood team was very good. The consistency was great. It feels like blood, it looks like blood, and you would think it's blood, and maybe it is. We make our own blood. We have our own formula. We've made it for the past 18 years. We have dressing blood and pumping blood and gel blood and gallons and mm -hmm. gallons and gallons of blood. When I work, I'm bloody 24-7. I'm bloody, I'm dirty, I'm sweating, and it's great. We were nice and pretty for the first week, and we were then worried about makeup, and now it's just a joke. It's wet, and it's cold, and it's really sticky, and it's sweet. You're flypaper, basically. You're attracting all these insects. That's really gross. Oh. The blood gets shot in me. And I could just see the blood coming at me. It was like a bucket of blood. This is so disgusting. Right, just give me some screaming like oh that. Oh my god, I'm really done. Use it! Keep screaming, Diora! Ah! I think when it comes to a picture like this in terms of trying to build suspense, you clearly have to approach the editing and the storytelling and the, the building blocks differently. There's only so much that you really want to show the audience. There's a lot of teasing of the audience that goes on. The director really went to great pains to make you feel Chrissy's point of view. As the audience, we can only see kind of what she sees. And of course, we go full frontal and show the whole thing. Steve Jablonski did the music. He was able to take that mood that he had created in the first one and expand on it. If you listen closely to the score, you can hear almost like a breathing. A lot of it happens when Leatherface is on screen. The chainsaw has a tone. When a chainsaw impacts something, it has a tone as well. We went in and found all the various squishy, meaty, gross noises you could find and just sort of layer those upon layer. We're not gonna show somebody's face getting peeled off cell by cell, but you're gonna hear it. The Texas Chinese Mask is like the granddaddy of horrific slasher. Yeah! This movie has to push the boundaries. You try and push it as far as you can. There are certain moments where we say, okay, we're just gonna go for it. It would be crazy to take a movie like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and try to tame it down. The audience that went to see the 2003 Chainsaw, they're gonna go see this and they wanna see more. I wasn't thinking in terms of Marcus's movie was here and we need to escalate to that. I just think it's important to show you the horror of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I like blood. It was frightening to direct, it was probably frightening to act, and hopefully it's frightening to watch.